Thank you. What you just seen right now is known as the American Indian Taos Hoop Dance, the style of old Indian dance is originally hundreds of years old, born in the village of the Taos to a young man's dream. Through the style of dance, our older people use hoops, creating images, showing respect to all living life. Some of our older ones, they say, Originally, this was a very old dance of courtship. The very first hoop used represented being born into the world. Throughout the dance, images of land, sky, water, animals, birds, bear, elk, deer, horse, tree, flower, turtle, an eagle's nest, even the formation of a snake into a ladder are created. Here's my right, this adobe home structure dwelling. Uh, this is the way it would have looked where this dance was born hundreds of years ago. People lived in homes very similar to this here. Looking upon the top, you will notice a large wooden ladder, one of the formations in the middle of the hoop dance. Traditionally, this dance was born out of the village of Taos. Two families kept this dance intact, known as the Lujan and the Trojillo family. The only notation of this dance ever exiting the village of Taos socially was taken around the year 1913. A few decades later, around World War II era, a man by the name of Tony Whitecloud from Hamas Pueblo became known within our native communities as the father of contemporary hoop dancing. Eventually, other Pueblo villages adopted it, the Navajo, Apache, Hopi, Zuni. The dance slowly spread from the Southwest into Oklahoma. Between the 1940s and 1970s, many tribes had adopted the dance, slowly moving its way into the Dakotas. Traditionally, one, three, to even five hoops was used in a traditional manner. As other tribes adopted the dance, more hoops were added for more flash. 
into contemporary times. For myself, my name is Gary Whiskey Heat. I'm a yokka. I come from a family known as the Chief Burnett Barnosen Ki O Kumikwa family. Originally, my family is from the Great Lakes region of the United States. My grandparents were relocated out of the territory of Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and northern Indiana. My grandfather's family was removed from Illinois. My grandmother's family was removed from northern Indiana, southern Michigan. Eventually, they ended up as prisoners of war in Kansas. Today, most people hear the word reservation. Reservations, historically, it is a sensitive topic, but they were actually jails. And reservations today are documented as the poorest places in the United States with very complicated issues even today in modern time. We are one of four federal tribal reservations in Kansas known as the Prairie Band Potawatomi Indian Reservation where family tribe today reside. A back there behind you, for those of you a little interested in history uh, or curious, there's some photographs back there documented through the Smithsonian Museum and the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. in those photographs. They are all pictures of my family, my father, grandfather, great-grandparents, and my grandmothers back home on the reservation where they lived. My grandparents, every single one of them, very well noted, documented chiefs and leaders in American history during the shaping of the United States. The feathers that you are looking at here on stage, the visual of the American Indian, and these are eagle feathers. I bring these out here to teach and educate people a little bit about them. It kind of plants a seed for people to understand historically the religious foundation of our people. The feathers you're looking at are regulated. They're extremely illegal. You're not allowed to sell them. You're not allowed to buy them. Today they are protected by the federal government under jurisdiction of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. If you are caught today selling or buying these feathers on the black market, you actually can go to jail for a very long time. Now Native American people have used them for thousands of years as a form of prayer. Our old legends say that the cry and screech of an eagle or a hawk had the ability and magic to pierce the fog of the physical realm into the spiritual. They were like antennas reaching up to the heavens above. But in the United States, 1962, the eagle was put on the endangered species list. During that time, most Americans in the United States did not know or realize but it was a federal law that Native American Indians within the United States having dual citizenship were not allowed to practice religious ceremony freely through the 1970s. If you think about it, just a little over 40 years ago, if you were an American Indian caught doing specific ceremonies or what they felt were causing trouble, you actually could be imprisoned. Many American Indians and our families continued anyways as they hid them underground. Many of them also fought for civil and religious rights. Up until the year 1978, the ban was lifted by President Jim Jimmy Carter, who passed the Freedom of Religious Act only for American Indians. Now today, in order to carry the feathers you are viewing here today legally, you must be a true-blooded tribal member documented from reservation enrollment to carry them legally within the United States First Nation Canadian and Alaska Native. The feathers to my left come from a bald eagle. The ones to my right come from a golden eagle. Again, everyone, my name is Gary Whiskey. I'm a yuk. I'm an enrolled tribal member of the Prairie Band Potawatomi Reservation of Northeastern Kansas. Out of the entire United States population, it is estimated that less than 2 million are American Indians. Over 6 million Americans identify as Native American history or in their genealogy and families, historically reservations were documented in a jail system out of tens of millions of North American natives through the 19th century. By 1900, the dawn of the 20th century, it was documented by the United States Federal Government Army, less than 237,000 North American Indians left within the entire United States. After 1871, they were officially documented as prisoners of war, or wards of the government. Most people do not know the Native Americans actually were not allowed to leave reservations freely, although in World War I, a European war that began in 1914, the United States involvement was in 1917. This was be the only time historically Native Americans were allowed to leave reservations to fight in battle. About 14,000 left the reservation, returning as veterans of war. Native Americans had to return back to reservations again where they were not allowed to leave war, become legal citizens of the United States until the year 1924. Here in Osbury Farm, on this stage here specifically, anything you ever observe here is never ceremonial but social as we celebrate social song and dance with all of you, the beautiful cultures around the world in a way of friendship, harmony, and healing. We thank you very, very much for being here today. If you have any questions about anything or would like to look into my family, you can look our family up in a very small documentary through Sundance, also through National Geographic's under my family's name, Smoke That Travels. To all of you out there, thank you so much. I know it's cold out there. Thank you all for sitting in this uh, cold weather for the show. Thank you very much and have a great day here at Knott's Berry Farm. Thank you.